I have sinned. I am aware that for my crimes, anything short of death is really merciful. We go to Bakersfield, California, for the sentencing of Jonathan Hearn. The 27-year-old pleaded guilty to manslaughter in the death of Robert Limon. Hearn killed the victim because he was having an affair with Limon's wife, Sabrina, and the two wanted to be together. The Limones were part of a local swingers club, and at first, Limon was OK with the affair. But when Limon later asked his wife to stop seeing Hearn, she and Hearn put a plan into action. Instead of a divorce, Hearn went to Limon's workplace, seen here in this surveillance video, and shot the father of two. Hearn was arrested and charged with murder. But the state also wanted to charge Sabrina. Hearn agreed to testify against her to avoid a possible life sentence. She was somebody that stood out to me automatically as having a role, magnetic personality. When you used the word affair, you were having sex with Miss Lamont. Yeah. It was a primarily emotional affair, though we were hooking up from time to time. We talked about things that I would say normal people who are dating or um, going out probably wouldn't discuss. Eventually, the couple began discussing ways to eliminate Limon. It definitely turned from humor into something that actually began to materialize. After reviewing the evidence, a jury found Limon guilty of murder, conspiracy, and being an accessory. A month later, after Hearn pleaded guilty to manslaughter, he goes before Judge John Brownlee to learn his sentence. But first, the former firefighter has a few things he'd like to say. To Robert's family and his dear friends, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for stealing your brother, your friend. I'm sorry for the effects of my pride and lust and anger. I'm sorry for my inexcusable involvement with Robert's wife. I'm sorry for the grief that I caused to Robert's mother that broke her heart to the two children whose dad I took away from them. I'm so sorry. I cannot deserve your forgiveness. I am aware that for my crimes, anything short of death is really merciful. By the grace of God, I am what I am. It's now up to Judge Brown to determine the sentence. It will be ordered that the defendant served 25 years, four months in prison. Three months later, Sabrina goes before the same judge to learn her sentence. As to count one, murder in the first degree, probation will be denied, and the defendant will be sent to the Department of Corrections for 25 years to life. Limon won't be eligible for parole until 2036, when she would be 56. Because of his guilty plea, Hearn is eligible for parole in 2028, when he would be just 38 years old. We head to the Milwaukee County Courthouse. The man on trial is 25-year-old Dwayne Cheney, who's charged with murder. Two years earlier, Cheney allegedly shot Michael Prescott in front of the victim's girlfriend, who also used to date Cheney. Tomorrow, this same ex-girlfriend is scheduled to testify against Cheney. That's Cheney in the sweater vest outside the courtroom during a break in the trial. He knows within 24 hours, the state's key witness is scheduled to appear. Cheney's allowed to walk freely inside the building because he has a GPS tracker attached to his ankle. Cheney had requested a speedy trial, but because the state could not accommodate, he was allowed to post a personal recognizance bond and be placed under house arrest, but required to wear the anklet. Multiple surveillance cameras record Cheney, who can be seen with his current girlfriend, Zuri London. After a few minutes, they go their separate ways. Now Cheney's speaking with his father, Frank Kyles. The two exit the hall, out of sight of the video cameras. About a minute later, London reappears. As she makes her way down the hallway. She appears to talk on her cell phone. And then she runs. 
She's on the move because Cheney has left the building and is trying to escape. He's removed his vest and casually walks with his father outside the courthouse. As Cheney and Kyle's approach an intersection, the defendant looks back, perhaps hoping to spot London. There she is. Notice a van pull up. All three quickly get inside. And behind the wheel, Flora Genia Cheney, the defendant's mother. Once inside, Cheney removes the GPS anklet and later tosses it out the window as he heads for freedom. Or so he thinks. The next day, Cheney's trial continues without him, and he's convicted of murder. Three days later, Cheney's captured by U.S. Marshals less than 10 miles from the courthouse, hiding in a garbage can. He's also hit with a new charge of bail jumping. As for his attempted getaway team, Cheney's mother and father are both charged with bail jumping as parties to the crime, a felony offense, while London's charged with obstructing an officer, a misdemeanor. They all pled guilty and received one to seven months in jail. And for the murder of Prescott, Cheney was sentenced to life in prison. Next, we head to Bernalillo County Metropolitan Court in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's Valentine's Day, and instead of playing Cupid, this woman is about to do something stupid. Stacey Ochoa has spent hours observing the day's proceedings, posing as a criminal justice student. Sitting in the gallery, Ochoa takes a few minutes to chat with lawyers, then approaches the bench, presumably to continue the discussion. Moments later, she takes a seat in one of the chairs reserved for inmates waiting to see the judge. As the lawyers turn their attention to the clerk, Ochoa slumps back. Now pay close attention to her left hand. Ochoa waits another minute, then quietly leaves the courtroom. About 20 minutes later, a group of inmates enter the courtroom. One of them, Frank Chappelle, taps an inmate sitting in front of him on the shoulder. Waiting till everyone's distracted with the business at hand, the inmate reaches under the seat where Ochoa previously sat. Authorities say Ochoa was not actually an inquisitive criminal justice student. It was all just an elaborate ruse used to pass an illegal Valentine's Day pick-me-up to a friend behind bars. She was charged with trafficking meth and distributing marijuana, and received three years probation. But there is a happy ending. Ochoa and Chappelle were married in 2019. I'm sorry for, you know, acting immature on the road. I understand that, you know, being on the road, you do have other people's lives in your hand. And, you know, I should have thought about that. Defendant Cyrus Matthews was there on misdemeanor charges stemming from a road rage case. As well as there's there, like, any way that we can reverse this jail time? Well, you're going to have to go to jail today. We need to get out to attend the hearing. We can consider furloughs. Okay, right now you're going to go to jail today. Okay? So you have to go to jail today, right? Matthew's girlfriend follows him out. There seems to be a moment of hesitation here on Matthew's part. We now know it's the bailiff trying to reason with him, explaining that his escape will lead to felony charges. To no avail. Now, the Wadsworth police take over.
Jack Matthews is way ahead, reaching speeds of up to 90 miles an hour. Officer James Walzer is receiving updates. Lyman from Maple. He was in an older gray Ford vehicle. 28, he's not. He's running red lights at Hartman. Passing on the right at Williams Reserve. My speed's 90, trying to catch up. Why red light? I think we're going to have a code 2. We're going to have a code 2 at Akron 76. Matthews has crashed into a white SUV seen just off the road there. Where's he at? That's Matthews' car there. All right, we're going to have multiple vehicles, airbag deployment. Ma'am, are you OK? OK. The passengers are a couple and their infant child. Okay. He's OK. All right, we got squads coming. Thankfully, they have non-life-threatening injuries. Help them get out! Help them get out! He's up here! Officer Walzer hustles over towards Matthew's car across the road. Walzer, I'm gonna need multiple squads. I need help, sir. Okay. You can hear that Matthews realizes he's made a truly horrible decision. What was going on? Why were you taking off? Because they kind of locked me up for 90 days, and I have a whole life. So what happened? I tried to run like a Why? I don't know. Matthews and his girlfriend are extracted by the Wadsworth Police Department and taken to the hospital. Matthews is charged with aggravated felonious assault for injuring his girlfriend and the occupants of the other vehicle. He's sentenced to 425 days in jail. His girlfriend is not charged. We head now to a hearing in Louisville, Kentucky. The defendant, James Roeder, has been charged with burglary. His alleged partner in crime, his wife, Ashley. They're both charged with breaking into a warehouse and stealing six flat screen TVs. At the time of the robbery, Ashley was pregnant. James, who's been locked up in county jail since his arrest, has had a no-contact order with his wife, meaning they're not allowed to speak to each other before their court cases because they're co-defendants. While they've been separated, Ashley gave birth to their son. You sure you're comfortable with this? Is this what you want to do? All right, just stay right there for just a second. The judge is addressing Ashley, <laughs> who's in court with her baby for her own hearing. James Roeder, who has just left the courtroom after his hearing, is being brought back in. I don't want you to say anything to me about your case at all. Don't say anything. Your lawyer's not present right now. But I understand that there is a chance that you're going to go back to Todd County and that your baby is a month old and you haven't met that baby yet. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Roeder, do you want to come up here? I know you have a no contact order between you and Ms. Roeder that I have, um, that I issued, and I'm not changing that. Yes, I'm making a temporary exception right in front of me on the record so that you can meet this baby. This is your son. Be careful. You see his little shirt? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could be a fair amount of time before Rotor sees his son again. <laughs> Give everybody some. All right. Thank you. Thank you. James Roeder is sentenced to four years for third-degree complicity burglary. And Ms. Roeder, you can stay up here because I'm going to call your case next. Ashley Roeder's given probation and is currently taking care of the couple's two children. Thank you for letting me be a part of that. If you all aren't teared up, then you're just heartless. <laughs> <laughs> These crimes are horrific. It's clear that you did everything you could, you and Larissa, to hide evidence to protect yourselves. Next, we go inside Cuyahoga County Common Police Court in Cleveland, Ohio. Judge Nancy Margaret Russo is about to impose a sentence on Larissa Rodriguez and her boyfriend, Christopher Rodriguez, for something unthinkable, the death of her five-year-old son, Jordan. 
One night, Christopher brought the boy, who had developmental needs, to his mother in a semi-conscious state. She gave him a cold shower and put him to bed. The next day, the child was dead. But instead of calling 911, the couple covered the child in blankets and bags full of mothballs and buried him in their own backyard. Nearly two months later, after a tip from Christopher Rodriguez's brother, police arrive at the home. The side door on it is open. I'm not sure if anyone's inside. Are there party kids here? You mind if you step in? We got a call wanting us to check on the well-being of the five, four to five-year-old. How many kids are good? Okay. What can we see? Do you have a child with special needs? Oh, Jordan? Yes, I do. How old is Jordan? Jordan, he is just turned five. Where's Jordan at? He's with his dad. What was the call mainly about? Just checking the welfare. She tells police Jordan's in Texas with his father, but she can't provide a phone number to reach them. So Jordan has, he has family members in Texas? Yes, yes. All right. Yes. Do you know any numbers or any, how to get in touch with anybody who actually lives in Texas? I mean, right now, his phone just got disconnected. What's his he just had his phone disconnected. He's going to be calling me with me. She's just lied to police. The following day, police return and confirm the tip from Christopher Rodriguez's brother, who said the boy's buried in the backyard. Larissa Rodriguez and her boyfriend are charged. The couple enter into a plea deal. Murder charges are dropped in exchange for pleading guilty to involuntary manslaughter, felonious assault, two counts of child endangerment, and abuse of a corpse. Judge Russo sentences Larissa Rodriguez first. The court imposed a sentence as follows. Counts one, two, and three to be served consecutive to each other and concurrent to the sentence imposed in count five for a total sentence of 25 years. But before sentencing Christopher Rodriguez, Judge Russo is compelled to make a statement. And I look at these photographs, and it's very hard. Mr. Rodriguez, this is a horror. I know as a judge, I'm not supposed to show emotion. And in 22 years, I never have. This is one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. Whatever this child's life was supposed to be, you make sure it didn't happen. You and Larissa, I didn't even hear you say you were sorry. I will not accept the recommendation for Mr. Rodriguez. Prosecutors and defense attorneys had agreed to a recommended sentence of 20 to 25 years. But for Judge Russo, the punishment doesn't fit the crime. These crimes are horrific. You had every opportunity at so many points to make a difference to get help, to call the police, to ask for help, to try to take him to the hospital. I have to imagine that at some point you got on the internet and said, how do I bury a body? Because this is unbelievable to me. The level of meticulousness that you went through to not be discovered, I honestly don't know how you live with yourself. I, I don't know how either one of you live with yourself. And with that, Judge Russo sentences Christopher Rodriguez. Your sentence is follows total sentence of 28 years. It's the maximum sentence available. Judge Russo goes three years beyond the recommended maximum the attorneys had agreed upon. Rodriguez appealed the ruling, but it was upheld. He and Larissa Rodriguez are currently serving their terms in separate locations in the Ohio prison system. I'm appalled and disgusted by what I've done. We're in Ogden, Utah, for the sentencing of 41-year-old Dia Millerberg. Three years earlier, Millerberg, her husband, and their 16-year-old babysitter, Alexis Rasmussen, were sharing alcohol, marijuana, and prescription drugs 
while engaging in sexual activity at the couple's home. The partying ultimately turned deadly after Eric Millerberg injected the 16-year-old with her third dose of heroin and methamphetamine, causing an overdose. Eric Millerberg, a convicted felon, allegedly feared he'd be sent back to prison if they alerted authorities. So the couple drove Rasmussen's body to a remote area and buried her in a shallow grave. Alexis Rasmussen remained a missing person for more than a month until a tip from a confidential informant led police to her body and back to the Millerbergs. Following the couple's arrest, Dia made an agreement with the prosecution to testify against her husband in exchange for a reduced sentence. She pled guilty to obstructing justice, unlawfully acquiring prescription drugs, and desecration of a dead body. For three years, Millerberg's been allowed to live free out on bail and was able to regain custody of her infant and elementary school-aged child. But now at sentencing, she's facing up to 15 years in prison. Before learning her sentence, Millerberg turns to face the victim's family. You may address the audience just now. For what I've done. I think it would only make things worse. I, I have no way to express the magnitude of grief that I feel for Alexis family for what I've done. But I take responsibility. And thank you for just letting me say peace. It's now up to Judge W. Brent West to make a decision. The bottom line is, um, Ms. Miller, that I do think that prison is the appropriate sentence in this particular situation. I realize that three years of allowing you to rebuild and your family and everything of that nature, and then to come in and say, OK, Judge, and you're going to destroy that. But I take these cases as, as I find them to be. Um, you know, I didn't have any control, but it took three years to bring this to trial. Judge West was asked by Millerberg's attorney to consider probation over prison. But he has much to consider. I have to balance society, the need for punishment, the need for rehabilitation. And I call due respect, Mr. Millerberg, sometimes it's not about the defendant. Thank you. But sometimes you do such acts that are such extreme and so heinous and afraid of burying this young girl's body and hiding it from the police. You've got to balance that, and you have to put it all in perspective. It's going to be the order and sentence of the court that you're to serve three indeterminate terms at the Utah State Prison of zero to five years. I will recommend that they run concurrent. Dia Millerberg ultimately served four years and two months in state prison. As for her husband, Eric Millerberg, he was convicted of child abuse homicide, obstruction of justice, unlawful sexual conduct with a minor, and abuse or desecration of a body, and was sentenced to six years to life in prison. Next, we head to South China for a hearing. Ms. Yang and her husband, Mr. Huang, have been taken to court by Huang's mother. She lent the couple money to pay for their wedding, and because they're currently going through a divorce, feared she would not be paid back. As the hearing goes on, Ms. Yang argues with her soon-to-be ex-mother-in-law. Mr. Huang takes exception to the tone his estranged wife takes with his mother and lets her know about it. With tensions high, that tap turns into an explosion.
The pair exchange blows, and in the heat of the moment, Mr. Huang's mother comes to her son's aid and joins in on the scuffle. As chaos ensues, Ms. Yang then directs all of her anger to the mother-in-law and strikes her in the head. The two begin to really go at it in an all-out brawl. As the pair struggle, Huang joins his mother, attacking his wife. The fight goes on, and a lone court official is tasked with keeping the trio separated. As he restrains the husband, the wife and mother-in-law continue their violent exchange. The officials finally able to separate the parties as police arrive for backup. When things seemingly calm down, the man breaking up the fight lets out an exasperated chuckle. Mom and son are cuffed, taken to the police station, and charged with assault. The husband was sentenced to 15 days detention and his mother to five days. We head to Union, South Carolina, for the sentencing of Jeremy and Christine Moody, who are all smiles as they stand before the judge. No, they are not exchanging vows. They're already married. They're also neo-Nazis who were found guilty of first-degree murder in the killing of Charles Parker and his wife Gretchen. The Moody's targeted Parker, who they did not know, after seeing his address in a sex offender state registry. The couple also believed God wanted them to eliminate all sex offenders. Surveillance footage from the Parker home helped police locate the killers, as did Jeremy's tattoos, including skinhead written across his neck, white power atop his head. When the couple were questioned, they didn't deny their guilt. In fact, they both not only confessed, they told authorities they planned to kill more sex offenders. The Moody's pleaded guilty to murder, kidnapping, and burglary, and are in court asking Judge Lee Alford for mercy, as well as the minimum sentence of 30 years in prison. Ask John. No, I was able to buy that over the credit. And I don't know what I've done as a sin, and I believe that God has forgiven me of it. Please have mercy on Christine and I so we can still have a chance to grow old together as husband and wife. Thank you. Next, it was Christine Moody's chance to plead for forgiveness. The Bible clearly states that I shall not kill. I'm sorry I broke that commandment, but I truly believe God has forgiven Jeremy and I. I will show it to you. Your Honor, please see fit that Jeremy and I are sentenced to the same sentence of 30 years. Never kissing my husband or feeling his touch again is my very worst nightmare. Please give us a light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. After taking in their words of remorse and request to remain together, it's now all up to Judge Alford. We would kill these two people. They had nothing, no way to defend themselves or anything else. And I tell you that uh, I believe that if these two would have got out of jail, um, I would be concerned that they would do exactly the same thing and uh, have any question about it. I, I think this is a case that justice is very enough and demands uh, a life sentence. After hearing their sentences, the murderous couple share a final kiss before they're separated. But as they exit the court, Whatever remorse they tried to convey has quickly disappeared. Outside the courthouse, the Moody's continue to express their true feelings. I think Jeremy and I would have done it again if given the opportunity. Do you have any regrets? I have no regrets. Killing that pedophile was the best day of my life. What about not being able to see Jeremy? Jeremy and I have a love that we would stand there. What about what you said in court about repenting? Is that not true then? 
No, it's not true. My lawyer made me say it. Do you have anything to say to the victim's family? May they die also. Jeremy and Christine Moody were both sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole.